Foster, and along with my wife, B.J. Foster, we lead this incredible church family, and we're so grateful, very, very grateful uh, to be here and see what God has done. I know we're on spring break. Who's on spring break right now? Who's on spring break right now? There you go. I see many people uh, well in their AARP years on spring break. That's exciting. That's very exciting. <laughs> But it's great. It's a great time of year. Beautiful day today. Uh, I'm excited that uh, God's given us this great day, again, to come together and worship and fellowship and encourage one another. We've been in this great series. It's a basic faith study series, basic faith study series. And it's basically the first principle series that we teach as a church. Again, globally, we've been teaching this uh, since the organization started in the late 70s. When I'm teaching, is uh, somewhat of a more informal version of that uh, series. If you go to our website, the entire series, there's seven studies, I believe, is on the resources, resources tab uh, on our website, uh, grccweb.org. And we have now uh, all four of the studies that I've taught. I'm teaching the fourth one today, which is the reality of the cross. All of those four studies are now formatted, and they're in the back of, of uh, the room on the resource table. So uh, please, if you want to see what we teach and see what we believe as a church, it's right there for you. Uh, it's been an incredible week. The paperback copies of my wife's book just arrived on yeah. Thursday. And, uh, we found, and uh, it's been great. It's been awesome because... Uh, She's put a lot of work into it. She's already working on another book, a children's book, um, uh, which will hopefully come out in the fall. But uh, it's just exciting. And then she spoke to uh, uh, the women in one of the regions in the L.A. church, which is uh, about 5,000, 6,000 members. Um, she spoke to one of the regions there. And uh, she spoke to a region uh, of women. It was over 250 women uh, this last uh, Saturday and uh, yesterday. And... Uh, it was great. The impact was awesome and outstanding. A lot of great feedback. So I'm grateful for what God's doing. But uh, let's uh, all stand. We're going to start with a couple of songs. Tracy is going to lead us in a couple of songs. And Jeff Miller is going to lead us in prayer before we get to those songs. So Jeff Miller, come on up here, brother, and lead us in a word of prayer. Let's have the song leaders come forward. God, you are so awesome. Mm -hmm. We're so very thankful, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, thankful that you are building lives together, that you're increasing our faith, that you're helping us to grow in you, Lord. You're helping us to confess sin and repent of it, Lord, and grow, growing closer to you, Lord. I pray that you continue this great and mighty work, Lord. And thank you so much for it. Thank you for this church. Help us, Lord, to get deeper and closer to you. Father, thank you so much for all you do. I'm in awe of you. And I pray, Lord, you'll bless this time now. Help us to be attentive to your word, Lord. Help us to take it in. Apply it to our lives, Lord, and live it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, if you'll stand with me. Come on, brother. We're going to sing number 103. It's also in your bulletin. I will call upon the Lord. <clears throat> All right. Men start this out. I will call upon the Lord.
Jesus is Lord. And the men are going to start this out. <coughs> Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How He loves me, how I love Him. He is risen. He until I started to get into my early 20s. And uh, at one point, I, I, uh, my parents went back to Hawaii. I was born in, in Southern California, born and raised there, but my parents ended up going back to Hawaii. And then I went to visit. And my mother uh, was a chef, she was a cook. And so uh, at, at a really large uh, facility, a uh, school in on Oahu. And so I tell this story from time to time of going to see her at work for the first time at this facility, uh, the Kamehameha School. It's a private school. And um, it's, a, it's an incredible, it's a cre incredible facility because they have, um, it goes from preschool to high school, all in the same facility. It goes up the side of a mountain like this. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's amazing. 
So she worked in one of the kitchens, and I remember I, I flew out there and I and I uh, went to the school, and when I got to the school, I was walking towards the kitchen where she worked, and um, it was it was between breaks, so there were no kids in the cafeteria at the time. And so I looked through this window, and my mother, who's four foot ten, was cooking at a pot that's built into the floor that's the size of a jacuzzi. It's, it's huge. It, it's ga it's gas-driven, it's gas-powered, and it's a big pot, but it's about the size of a jacuzzi. It's huge. It's, a, it's an industrial, uh, 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 basically industrial uh, cookware. But she was standing on a stool, and she was stirring the pot with an oar. Wow. What? What? And I was watching her do that, and it made me flash back to all of the sacrifices that she had made for us, and everything that she did for us when we were growing up, and all the hard work that she put in, and all the sacrifice that she made to make our family experience as great as she possibly could. As we grow older as Christians, we have to go to the cross, which we're going to talk about today, again and again, and better understand, better take hold of, make real the sacrifice that was made on the cross. We, we, we can't take it for granted, and we basically have to go after this, the Holy Spirit, go after the Spirit, and ask the Spirit, please, open wide my heart and my mind, my soul, my entire being to better understand the sacrifice that was made by Jesus on the cross. In Philippians 2, there's a passage that starts out in verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. That's how he wants his family of believers to be. Then he goes on, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Then he goes on, Paul goes on, and again, he's, he's writing the church in Philippi, and there's this incredible description of the heart and the sacrifice and the humility of Christ. It says in verse 5, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself absolutely nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Even death on a cross. If you've grown up hearing those words again and again, your challenge, your calling is to make the reality of those words more real, deeper than every year that goes by. You want the cross to be vibrant in your heart and in your mind. When I think about my mother and the sacrifices that she made, I, I remember one moment, I was very, very young, but I walked into, uh, I walked into my parents' room and my dad was overseas at the time, and he and my mom were having an argument on the phone. And my mom was in tears. And I was pretty young. Probably lower elementary school years. But I just re I remember seeing my mom crying and kind of hearing the argument, but I just felt for my mom. Because she was trying to raise four kids, and even as a kid, I knew how deep that sacrifice was. Then as I got older, I experienced how deep that sacrifice was. We have to make the cross real. 
And so as we take the bread and the fruit of the vine today, the bread representing the body of Christ, the fruit of the vine representing his blood, we've got to pray and beg the Spirit to make that sacrifice real in ourselves. So that, so that we, we never lose gratitude or hope or faith in how great and majestic our God is in sending His Son that we could have eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, Jesus, we, we want more from our hearts and minds and souls and spirit all the time. But at times, God, we just get lazy and we, and we don't do what we ought to do and, and we don't become what we ought to become as we get caught up in things here. It's the human condition. Pierce our hearts in a way where we can see and experience and know and understand, appreciate the sacrifice that was made on the cross. What it all means. Your intention, your design, your desire, your devotion to us, even though we turned our backs on you, your devotion to us still. Help us to find, to be led by you to, to new ways to better understand, to better know what sacrifice truly is, especially the sacrifice that was made on the cross. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
God build the church up uh, in a great way, and more to come, more to come. Uh, there are two couples uh, who have contacted us, and, and I've mentioned a few times, um, that are, uh, while one of the couples, uh, the husband has a job here already, and he's working here remotely, and uh, they'll be here probably, I think, in the, in the summer, spring, summer. And then one of the other couples um, are in the Bay Area, and uh, they, uh, uh, Veronica, I think she spoke in one of the women's classes this month, mm -hmm. and they'll they'll be here, I think, in a couple of weeks to visit for a week. Please don't scare them away. And uh, and then they'll be back. Uh, having, I, I think they're having a house built with sparks. Um, but it's just great to watch God bring more and more people. I know uh, there's uh, people uh, on the live stream as well, uh, staying safe at home, and that's great. But uh, I'm just really encouraged by it. All that God's doing. Bobby Winkleman back from Sardinia. Amen. 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 Great to have you here. Uh, so glad uh, that you're back with us, bro. Uh, let's pray. Let's go to God's God, the Spirit, and then we'll get into the lesson. <laughs> Heavenly, Heavenly Father, ah, this is such a daunting, powerful lesson. Uh, the cross and, and preaching and teaching on it and just communicating everything that you want communicated today, Father, that you want taught, that you want inspired in this church family. Father, help us open our minds, open our hearts, open our souls, crack us open, Father, so that we can hear and see and feel and experience everything you want us to know today. The cross. We gotta make it real. We gotta make it real. Help us, Father, today. Again, as we pour through your word, as we better examine, deeper examine the sacrifice that was made. Help us, God, to, to grasp it fully and to think about it again and again and dwell on it. And just to see all the many facets of it. And again, never take it for granted. Lord, thank you for this church family. Uh, so excited just to watch more and more miracles. Uh, people uh, being open and vulnerable and reaching out and sharing and giving and sacrificing. It's just, it's, it's your word in action. I'm so humbled by it. Uh, just thank you, God, for everything you're doing here and help us to Again, to walk uh, in your light, uh, to be in step with the Spirit in a way that pleases you, that glorifies you, and brings it all back to you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and give great thanks. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, let's go to our outline, the reality of the cross. The reality of the cross. And uh, this is, the, this is the, uh, the fourth of four studies that I, I've taught and again, uh, this, is, uh, this is one of seven studies that are, it, it's on the, the website, and uh, you can go there and see kind of the formal presentation of it. This is more of an informal presentation uh, in that I want to make it accessible as possible uh, to everyone. And uh, this study, it, it's daunting in that you're talking about the cross. You're talking about the most important moment in history of mankind. And... When I, when I look at this particular study and, and how it was designed, how it was formatted uh, uh, years ago, um, there's a lot of reading. We won't cover all of the reading because you, you basically start uh, in Matthew 26 and you, and you work your way towards uh, kind of the end of Matthew 28. But what we're going to do today is take a portion of it and, um, again, enough to where we can really take hold of what the what the focus of the study is all about. And really the focus of it is, is applying the cross to your life. Jesus died for you. And I know you hear it, and you, you hear it all the time, and you've heard it since you were a child, but you've got to make it real. And it's got to, it's got to work on your heart and your soul and your spirit <clears throat> year after year after year to a place where you appreciate it more and more. As I share, when I look about the, sacri at the sacrifices that my mother made for me as a child, and now, a a a as I'm in a much, as a much older adult, I appreciate more and more and more of what she did, how she did it, why she did it. Mm. it to, to be 
in, in a relationship, a marriage relationship that was that was so verbally abusive and and, and just and physically abusive to the kids, and and just and just to, to fight to stay in that relationship and keep the family going. All the things that my mother did, uh, they just amaze me. They astound me. And when I look at the cross, and I look through the scriptures, and I look at the examples, and, and you're going to hear some things today, and read some things today that, you, that some of you probably never read, about what Jesus did. I, again, I'm moved by it, and I want to grow. I want to grow and mature in my perspective, spiritually, biblically, of what the cross is all about. The reality of the cross. Point number one. The crucifixion of Jesus. We're going to start in Matthew 27, verses 27 through 44. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe, they took off the robe and put his clothes on him. And they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This is Jesus. This is your King. So, in this part of the passage, and again, there's so much going on in chapter 26. Now we're in chapter 27. There's so much happening here. But you're looking at the physical punishment and torture of Jesus beginning far beyond, far beyond the point of where he's actually hanging on the cross. There's a lot happening here. And I know we tend to think of the suffering being primarily as he's hanging on the cross, but the, that suffering started long before he got to the cross. They twisted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. From there, there's bleeding. Bleeding from a scalp. Bleeding from a skull. In verse 30, they spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. So they're taking basically a piece of wood and they're hitting him with it. Again and again as they're spitting on him. Now remember, Jesus was with God in heaven, then came to earth, allowed himself to be born as a child, as a human, walk this earth, has the power to stop what's happening, but doesn't. It's, it's one thing to have something happen to you. It's one thing that's different to allow something to happen to you even when you can stop it. And again, I, I think at times for believers, we, we look at this example. We look at what Jesus did on the cross and it's hard for us to grasp. We know it, but it's hard for us to grasp because we can't picture ourselves doing it. How did he do it? How did, how did he go that far? But yet, we've got to keep reaching and praying, asking the Spirit to help us better understand the reality of what happened on the cross. The crucifixion for Jesus was execution, torture, and humiliation. He did it for you and for me. This is the reality that we have to accept and appreciate the range of thoughts and emotion that it brings throughout our lifetime. Every face of our life as believers, as followers of Jesus. You look at the outline here. I'm sorry, you look at the uh, commentary here on, our, on your outline from the Life Application Study Bible. 
Condemned prisoners had to carry the, their own crosses to the execution site. Jesus, weakened from the beatings he had received, was physically unable to carry his cross any further. Thus a bystander, Simon, was forced to do, do so. Simon was from Cyrene in northern Africa. And so there's a lot happening here. Now, to give us better understanding, go to the back page or the back side of your outline. And this is an excerpt of a medical account of the crucifixion of Jesus, the crucifixion of Christ. This isn't the whole, this isn't the, the whole article. This is written by uh, C. Truman Davis. It was published in the Arizona uh, Medicine in 1965. It was reprinted by, I believe, New Wine Magazine in 1982. And different churches, different denominations use this article to help people better understand more of what happened on the cross. The entire article is on our website, but this is a portion of the article that I want to dive into now and kind of slowly walk through it to again help us better understand what's happened here. Preparations for the scourging were carried out when the prisoner was stripped of his clothing and his hands tied to a post above his head. It is doubtful the Romans would have made any attempt to follow the, the Jewish law in this matter, but the Jews had an ancient law prohibiting more than 40 lashes. Roman legionnaire steps forward with the flagrum or flagellum in his hand. This is a short whip consisting of several heavy leather thongs with two small balls of lead attached near the ends of each. The heavy whip is brought down with full force again and again across Jesus' shoulders, back, and legs. At first, the thongs cut through the skin only. Then as the blows continue, they cut deeper into the subcutaneous tissues, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. The small balls of lead first produce large, deep bruises, which are broken open by subsequent blows. Finally, the skin of the back is hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. When it is determined by the centurion in charge that the prisoner is near death, the beating is finally stopped. The half-fainting Jesus is then untied and allowed to slump the stone pavement, pavement wet with his own blood. Stop there for a moment. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a lot. I know 26 uh, years ago, almost 27 years ago, when this was first read to me, and I was reading along uh, with, with a copy of my own. There's a lot in here I did not know. And to have it detailed like this by a physician, it was helpful, insightful, and painful at the same time. Because I never saw the cross like this. I knew it. I'd seen films. Uh, I, I'd heard about it obviously through many sermons in many different churches all throughout my young life and my young adult life. But when I was reading this, this really impacted me in a deep way because it made more clear the sacrifice that Jesus made, the suffering that he went through for me. To make the cross real, you have to personalize it. Oh, that, this, this, what happened here, this is for... Um, this is for everyone. So it applies to everyone. Well, yeah, you're right. But you've got to personalize it. What if you were the only one? It still would have been done. It still would have been done. This is the sacrifice that Christ makes. The Roman soldiers see a great joke in this provincial Jew claiming to be king. They throw a rope across his shoulders and place a stick in his hand for a scepter. They still need a crown to make their traps to complete. Flexible branches covered with long thorns, commonly used in bundles for firewood, are plated in the shape of a crown, and thus, and this is pressed into a scalp. Again, there is copious or profuse bleeding, the scalp being one of the most vascular areas of the body. After mocking him and striking him across the face, the soldiers take the stick from his hand and strike him across the head, driving the thorns deeper into his scalp. So he's being hit, and that crown of thorns that you're very familiar with seeing that crown of thorns is being driven into his scalp, driven into his skull, if you will. Finally, they, they tire of their sadistic sport, and the robe is torn from his back. 
already ha having adhered to the clots of blood and serum in the wounds, its removal causes excruciating pain, just as in the careless removal of a surgical bandage, and almost as though he were again being whipped, the wounds once again, once more, begin to bleed. In deference to Jewish custom, the Romans return his garments, the heavy patibulum or cross beam of the cross is tied across his shoulders, and the procession of the condemned Christ, two thieves, and the execution detail of Roman soldiers headed by a centurion begins its slow journey along the Via Dolorosa. In spite of his efforts to walk erect, the weight of the heavy wooden beam, together with the shock produced by copious blood loss, is too much. He stumbles and falls. The rough wood of the beam gouges into the lacerated skin and muscles of the shoulders. He tries to rise, but human muscles have been pushed beyond their endurance. The centurion, anxious to get on with the crucifixion, selects a stalwart North African onlooker, Simon of Cyrene, to carry the cross. Jesus follows, still bleeding and sweating the cold, clammy sweat of shock, until the 650-yard journey, which is six football fields and a half. From the Fortress Antonia to Golgotha is finally completed. Jesus is offered wine mixed with myrrh, a mild analgesic mixture. He refuses to drink it. He refuses to be numbed out. Simon is ordered to place the patibulum on the ground, and Jesus is quickly thrown backward with his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire feels for the depression. At the front of the wrist, he drives a heavy, square, wrought iron nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly, he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some flexion and movement. The patibulum is then lifted and placed at the top of the stipes, and the titulus re reading, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is nailed in place. The left foot is now pressed backward against the right foot with both feet extended, toes down, a nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails and the wrists, excruciating pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails and the wrists are putting pressure on the median nerves as he pushes himself upward to avoid this uh, stretching torment. He places his full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, there is the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet. At this point, as the arms fatigue, great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, the pectoral chest muscles are paralyzed, and the intercostal, or rib muscles, are unable to act. Air can be drawn to the lungs, but cannot be ex exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he's able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in the life-giving oxygen. Now, why did I write continued at the end of the article? Because there's a lot more to the story, right? There's a lot more to the story. But my point in sharing this portion of the article is for us to better understand the sacrifice made by Jesus in his early 30s for us to have what we have. Eternal life. Life with the Spirit. Being in the presence of God Himself. The Word. The Kingdom. Everything that we have comes through this sacrifice. And it's not pretty, is it? It's ugly and it's dark. And at times we don't like to think about it because it is so ugly, because it is so dark, and because it was done for us. But yet... This is much of the foundation of our faith, isn't it? And we've got to go back to it. We've got to go back to it and think it through. And we've got to go back and meditate on it and think about the sacrifice that was made. Not just the violence of it, but the devotion to it. Amen. When I think back at my mother and the many, many times, I remember there were moments when, when we were getting as the three boys in the family, my sister was the oldest, there were times when we were getting physically beaten. Just slapped around. 
And my mother couldn't do anything about it without reaping her own whirlwind if she did. And yet she stayed in the marriage and in the family to do whatever she could to protect us. And so decades later, as I look back on it, I, I can see the devotion. And in my mom's last moments, the night before she passed away, when, when all of us were there at her bedside, then everybody then everyone had to leave. And I was there, and my sister was there. And my mom asked me to, to put her in bed because she, she was in the living room of, of, uh, of her house, this tiny house in a senior living center uh, community. And I picked her up, and I, and I set her down in the center of the bed. And, and as I set her down, she was smiling and happy that I was just there. She was in her early 80s, and I thought, she's done so much for me. When we look at the cross, we got to be thinking about what's been done for us. That's what it's about. It's not about morality. It's not about that at all. It's about spirituality. It's about being a step with the Spirit. The Pharisees were all about morality, right? And we know that. And Jesus saw right through it. And so we've got to focus on being in the Spirit, seeing that love and experiencing that love in our everyday walk with God. Is this a high calling? Yes, it is. But if you want your faith to be vibrant and alive, like several of the older members here. If, if you want that, then you've got to do this. You've got to go back to the cross and let the cross move you and shape and form you and inspire you. Point number two, the death of Jesus, Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. Back on your outline. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elisha. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elisha comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up. His spirit. He gave up his spirit. In that moment, he dies. In that moment, the sacrifice is completed. He dies. In the commentary here, Jesus was not questioning God. He was quoting the first line of Psalm 22 when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A deep expression of anguish he felt when he took on the sins of the world, which caused him separation. The physical agony was horrible, but even worse was the separation from God. It was being apart from God that was so hard, so painful. The suffering was great, but far greater was being apart from God. And that's the kind of devotion that we want in our relationship with the Father. And so when we examine the cross and we see this death on the cross, we have to go back and see why the sacrifice was made. It was made for us. For God so loved the world. So for God so loved people that He gave up His Son. That's what this is about. And you want to come back to that in your face, in your faith, and embrace this gift of ultimate sacrifice. And then help others. You want to help others do the same. 
Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what he's talking about. That's how deep it is. And so when we come to begin to know God and see this sacrifice, we want to experience that devotion further and further and further, deeper and deeper. 1 Corinthians 15.5 Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? John 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they will die. The significance, the significance of the cross is making the cross count in your life. Are you doing that? You gotta ask yourself, am I doing that? Because once you do that, or I should say when you do that, and you do it again and again, then you're bringing the power of the cross, the purpose of the cross, the intention of the cross, back to where God wants you to be. And that takes practice again and again and again. Point number three. You guys still with me? I know this is sobering, but it's powerful. Amen. This is sobering, but it's powerful, and this is what it's all about. Point number three, made alive in Christ. Ephesians chapter two, verses one through five. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the, the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Because of Christ, we have the life that we have. And when that's stated here in Ephesians, as Paul is writing the church in Ephesus, you've got to look at the cross and see that it's not just the teachings of Jesus, but it's the devotion to the point of going to the cross. That makes the difference. Yes. It's not just words. Yes. He did it. He lived it. He experienced it. And we've got to go back to that. And if you find yourself leaning more towards the, the wisdom of the word and how to live better, mm. rather than the sacrifice of Jesus, then you're, you're drifting yeah. from the focus of that devotion, the intention, the heart behind it. When you become a disciple, you're a disciple of Jesus, not just a disciple, a disciple of Christ. As a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus. This is what he did. So when you're in struggle, when you're in challenge, when you're hurting, when you need comfort, you've got to go back to this example. In the Message Bible, in the same passage, the transla translation reads, It wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it, all of us, doing what we felt like doing. When we felt like doing, when we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and, and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in mercy and with an, an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. In the commentary here, on your outline. 
Here Paul emphasizes that we do not need to live any longer under sin's power. The penalty of sin is power over us. We're miraculously destroyed by Christ on the cross. Through faith in Christ we stand acquitted or not guilty before God. God does not take, take us out of the world. We're still here. We still feel like sinning and sometimes we will still sin. The difference is we were once dead in sin, but now we're alive with Christ. We're alive with Christ. Two things I want to share and then we're done. Well, one is, when you're a father and you sacrifice for your children and, and, and you do things for your kids, you, yes, you want gratitude expressed, but even beyond that, you want to see joy in your children. That that's why you did it. You, you sacrificed to have your children experience great joy and freedom. That's why you did it. Thanks is always appreciated when it's expressed. But joy, that's what a father really wants. In our walk with God, we want to strive to experience and express joy to our Father. Because He sent His Son to do this. To make all the sacrifice and us either stay locked in sin or be unappreciative of the freedom that we have being made alive in Christ. That's got to be painful. As a father, as God the Father, that's got to be painful. I was praying about this message and about all of us taking in this message from a deeper place when I was down right there, the river, yesterday. And I was walking and praying and walking and praying just asking God, please move through us so that we can hear everything you want us to hear, everything you want us to know. And as I was praying, I was looking at everything around the river. And when you stand on the bridge right out here at Doris Car Park, uh, there's two rocks. There's two big boulders in the river. One of them's higher than the other. When the river starts to rise, the, the rock that's lower gets covered. And the rock that's higher, it gets covered by more water. It doesn't get covered completely, but you can tell the river is rising and the river is starting to move faster. As I sat, stood there yesterday and was watching it, I was reminded of, as a boy, growing up near the ocean and going to the beach every summer, and just the freedom that I felt being out in the water. Last year, uh, I bought a small raft and I started rafting the river at Doris Car Park for fun and exercise. And it brings me great joy. So now as I was looking at the water and I can see the water lapping over this rock now, the lower rock, I thought, I can go out there pretty soon. Not too soon because it's freezing in that water. But I can go out there and enjoy it. I can go out there and ride the river. Something so simple, but it brings me such great joy. What does my father think when I'm out there on the river? Enjoying what he created. And having a spirit that's free by this sacrifice. Mom. He experiences great joy. If I experience joy in my walk, he experiences joy as a father. And so if in your life right now, you've been experiencing challenge, and it's been hard, I, I don't discount at all your challenge, your challenges. But you've got to find joy. You've got to find joy and embrace it fully. You've got to find that joy you got to find that joy and hold on to it and thank God for it. You've got to go deeper and deeper 
in that place of understanding what's here and what God's done. In 1998, I was in the ministry in L.A. and I went and saw a film called Saving Private Ryan. The film is a really, the synopsis of the film basically is eight soldiers who have already gone through the battle to beach at Normandy. They're, they're basically charged to go find another soldier, Private Ryan, and bring him back so he can go back to the U.S. Because his, all of his other brothers had already been killed in battle. And they didn't want this mother to lose her last son. Mm -hmm. So the eight soldiers go out and they sacrifice themselves so that this soldier could be saved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the very end of the film, you see the soldier as an old man, much older than me, that's old. As an old man, and he, he's at the gravesite of some of the men who saved him, who died for him. And he looks at his wife in the film, and he, he makes two statements. He looks at his wife, and he says, tell me I've lived a good life. And the second statement is, tell me I'm a good man. And he's asking that. He's saying that. Because he wants to make sure that he's honoring that sacrifice that's been made. And that's what this is about. It is not about playing church. It is about appreciating the sacrifice here. And so we've got to go back and let the cross move through us as painful as it can be at times. It's not near the pain that Jesus suffered. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we do that, we experience true freedom. Yeah. True freedom. Christianity is not about ideology. Yeah. It's not about ideology. Yeah. It's about love. It's about love. That's what this is. That's what the cross is. If you say, I believe in God and I believe in the Bible then what you're saying is you believe in everything I just shared with you. Everything that was shared from the scriptures. That's what you're saying. So if there's a discrepancy between the two, and you're not really embracing the cross, then you've got to go back to the cross and see what's really there. In these four studies that I've taught, Word of God, Discipleship, light and darkness, and now the cross. In these four studies, you know enough to get your life right with God and walk and begin walking with God in a great way. Mm -hmm. And that's why we teach these studies. Simple, basic, fundamental salvation studies. Mm -hmm. But it's all fueled by devotion. It's all fueled by love. My mother loved me. So she literally stood in the way of abuse for me. And I can see as clear as day. We as Christians, as believers, we want to look at the cross and see it as clear as day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together today. God, I pray that we are sobered by your truth, sobered by your devotion, inspired by your love. Help us, God, to not play church, but to be true believers. And that takes work. Help us to be humble, humble in spirit, always learning. Always listening, wanting to know, and then be willing to take action. Where we need to change and be different, where we need to repent. Father, help us to look at the cross and see and experience the sacrifice there. 
see it as much as we possibly can. Yeah. You're the creator. We're the creation. <clears throat> but then everything we do, Father, everything we do as believers, as Christians, as disciples, help us to do it knowing and experiencing the devotion that is the cross. Lord, we love you and we thank you so very much for this time today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Turn and face someone right now. Turn and face someone right now and say, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Amen. Let's appreciate each other. Let's appreciate the cross. You're dismissed. Have a great Sunday.